So we start with our metta chant in the beginning. It's a lovely teaching about loving kindness that I also wanted to talk about a little bit uh, in the second half after the meditation because we just had Valentine's Day recently. So I thought it would be appropriate to talk about that. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be happy. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness. One should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to false views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay, very good. Right, thank you. What? Has anyone sitting in the audience come to one of my retreats at Jana Grove? Uh, that was just when we were filming, but not actually a retreat I was leading. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> because I'm going to use some, some of the slide material that I use um, during my uh, weekend retreats. But I mean, even if you've been there and you've heard it, sometimes we need to hear things a couple of times to be reminded. Also, when I'm listening to the talks of Ajahn Brahm in the monastery, very often when he talks about a topic, I, I've actually heard the topic before. But he just explores it from a different angle or I, I had something happen in my life that kind of opens up my mind to hear it in a different way. So even when the Buddha was teaching, he often repeated the teachings or when he was teaching one thing, he was teaching it many, many times because our minds are so used to do things in a certain way. So we have very strong habits that are established and to establish a new habit, you have to kind of keep repeating the good things and have to slowly let them seep into your mind. So what I thought I would talk about um, in terms of a little bit of meditation instruction, because uh, before we meditate together, is the so-called stress response 
and the relaxation response that um, exists in, uh, in our bodies and in our biology and also in our minds. But of course, we want to lean towards the coolness, and that's why I have this um, kulala, the koala there, and uh, kangaroo, which is relaxing on that picture there. Um, Paul Gilbert, who is the father of <laughs> compassion-focused therapy, had this uh, little kind of very nice a uh, anecdote that I wanted to use in the beginning. So he was talking about the zebras, like the zebra that you see on the screen here. It's actually two of them, and they are just happily grazing and uh, in a very relaxed and calm mood on this picture here. So they are in the kind of relaxation mode of the different modes that we have. But once a lion or a tiger rocks up, that very, very quickly changes, and the relaxation mode changes into the stress mode and the stress reaction to a stressor, which is this lion in this picture here. But what happens with zebras is once they get away from that lion, very, very quickly, they calm down again, they eat grass again, and they enjoy their life. So there isn't any zebra who is going to go like, wow, that lion, it was so close. Just imagine what would have happened if it would have eaten me alive. <laughs> or it goes back and says like, and what would have happened to my children? I have three children. <laughs> so a zebra uh, doesn't really think in that way. It's something that I think we can say maybe only human beings are doing. And that's kind of a stress response that doesn't stop. So this stress, is, which is very natural and which helps us to get away from something <coughs> which is threatening, doesn't stop. It carries on in our minds, and when it carries on in our minds, it influences our body, and we have very, very similar reactions to this running zebra, even though there isn't a lion there, even though there isn't a um, sable-toothed tiger there. So in the past, it was very, very useful. When we were living in the Serengeti, then these things could happen. But these days, they don't really happen anymore. So the question um, that we, or I kind of asked myself is, why is it that the zebras don't have this reaction? Or if they do have the reaction, they calm down very quickly. So usually these days, what people do, I hear, is they Google to find out <laughs> things. So I um, went on the internet to have a little look. And uh, I must admit, when I saw this first picture, it, it, it wasn't that clear. You know, sometimes there is some fake news on the internet as well, so I was like, I can't really trust this picture. But when I saw the next one, I said, aha, <laughs> zebras meditate. And because they are meditating, they can switch back into the relaxation mode very, very quickly. So if we learn to meditate and to handle our minds in the same way, we will be able to switch as well. Now, of course, I, I was a bit cheeky here. I, I got some pictures and kind of mixed and mingled them together and created a picture that looks like this. <laughs> but basically what the stress response is, uh, we see in this next slide here. So again, we have the stressor or a stress that is happening in our lives. And here it's a natural stress, so it's a bear. But what very often happens in our day-to-day -day life is that we don't have real tigers, we have so-called paper tigers. Or we have messages that come in on our computer or on our cell phones, and they actually do the same thing to our system. There is a bit of excitement there, which kind of gives us a bit of dopamine and makes us awake and might give us a little bit of happiness and a little bit of a boost, but actually it's a stress response that is happening. And the three stress responses that um, biology has in store is to either fight, to um, flight, or to freeze. So if you look at the animals in the animal kingdom, um, with the zebra, that runs away. Um, and you might have other animals that actually fight because they are big enough or they have poison or whatever. And then there is the response of freezing. So you might have seen that with 
um, lizards or things of such sort. So they just play dead, basically. And then some of those um, stressors that come along or some of those enemies that come along think, you know, this animal is already dead and their instincts don't work that well anymore. And so they stop chasing or hopefully eating that animal. So the stress response, as I said, fight, flight, freeze. Uh, quite easy to remember, um, three words with an F in the beginning there. And they are kind of caused, or the emotions that come with it, for us humans, very often is anger. So we get angry, we get righteous, we want to protect ourselves, and we fight against whatever comes up. So again, sometimes it might be your boss, or it might be someone who misbehaves, or it might be a letter that's in your letterbox, whatever it is. And the flight response is connected with fear, with wanting to get away from things. And the freeze response very, very often has to do with a feeling of helplessness. So we are so overwhelmed with a situation that we don't really know what to do. And we sometimes freeze physically, but we sometimes also freeze mentally, where we just can't think straight and uh, we sometimes even kind of start to beat ourselves up or think we are the problem that's kind of like a freezing that happens there as well so in our day-to-day life there is different stresses as i said before so with this person here there is some building work happening in her house Uh, (laughs) the picture is very nice though so she kind of has this little bar for the people who are listening to this on on her um, forehead which says loading (laughs) like on a computer, so you have a situation that is stressful, and if that stress continues, it kind of loads you up to what comes next. So you have exposure to stress, and again, you can't drop it in that situation. Sometimes you can't even drop it at night. So you have this person who is sleepless here and maybe even has some some pills there on the on the table next to the bed, and the sheep's sheep uh, on top are jumping over, but they're fr- stress written on them. And when that continues, then it kind of piles up, and the next reaction usually is this. <laughs> so that means we have a stressor, stress that causes worry, that doesn't stop. And then we have an overreaction to something which wouldn't normally let us react in such a bad way. So I'm sure we all know this. There are some things happening in our lives. We can't really let them go. We can't sleep very well. And we get in a mind state where you don't need a lot and you're triggered very, very quickly. But if we're able to catch it early, to have pauses, to go into the relaxation response every now and again, then we can balance this out. And that's what nature actually does. So the next thing here is a little toy. Um, In English, I was told it's called Jack in a Box. (laughs) I don't even know how it's called in German. But uh, you all know how it works. Um, It's a little box that is closed and has a little button or something you kind of push and then it opens up and this kind of, what what, what is that called? I mean, it's it's Jack, I guess, or does it have another name? This little figure comes out of the box and that's kind of like the stress response that I was describing before. So there's different ways of dealing with this. One way is to try and lessen the stress in your life and have less things that can stress you so that there isn't those triggers anymore. (laughs) But that is possible, but a bit more difficult because there will always be things in life that go wrong or that don't quite, you know, uh, meet our expectations or whatever it is. So the best way is actually, even though there are some triggers that will come in, if there is no jack in the box, we don't really have that reaction anymore and uh, you might have some experiences from your life so far that there has been things that have been triggering you in the past 
but you kind of learn over the years to handle these things and you don't have the same kind of reaction ready in that box to spring out when something happens and even though the trigger comes it opens up but there is nothing inside and that's kind of the, the aim of meditation over long term to take the jack out of the box so even when things happen in life that we don't react to them that strongly anymore so what we human beings have that zebras don't have we might call imagination and it's something which can be very very useful because zebras they don't have roads they don't build cities they don't go on the computer and kind of order something on Amazon and it's on their doorstep the next day so imagination and planning can be something useful but the problem is, if we're not careful with it, then we are misusing that imagination. And then it becomes what we call worry. And I don't think there is any worried zebras out there. There was even a book that was written by another psychologist, and the title of the book was Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers. And it kind of went along the same lines, because they don't have this kind of stress response. I was talking about fear before, and one of the things I like to do for myself and also when I teach, so people can remember how something works, to use acronyms. And one very good acronym I heard during the global conference when it was in Perth was the acronym for fear. Fear usually is false expectations about reality. Because if there is really something which is happening, we have the stress response, it's useful. In the moment, we react to whatever we have to react. We try to solve the problem. But fear often overblows the whole problem and triggers very unhealthy ways of dealing with things. So that was the stress response. In order to understand it, it's good to kind of talk about it a little bit. But what we are really after is the relaxation response and the kind of catch words for the relaxation response are rest and digest so that's what the zebra was doing when it was just hanging out maybe you know there was also eating in there but it's it's just the state of our bio biology and mind where we let go of things where we relax where we settle things where we have the uh, parasynthetic um, nervous system that comes online instead of having the uh, syn um, what is the other one called? Parasynthetic and sympathetic. sympathetic. That's right. Thank you. System there, and it is triggered with, for human beings when we are trying to use imagination, but in a good way, with words like feeling safe or like feeling there is a refuge that you can kind of pull yourself back into. It's like when you come home after a busy day and you feel happy at home, or when you learn to meditate and you learn to really go inside your body and inside your mind and hang out with those peaceful mind states. A picture often says more than many, many words, and those picture for, pictures for me really kind of encapsulates what those feelings are about and how they um, kind of feel inside. Um, animals very often pets um, have this beautiful ability to trigger those kind of feelings in us so i'm very very sure that this cat is kind of in a relaxation mode in that picture here but also the human being kind of gets pulled into the same mind state and the picture on the other side here is actually uh, one of my friends the dog um, is very happy when i come and, and see her because we wear the same clothes we have the same outfit and the girl which is hugging the dog there is the um, daughter of my godchild in Switzerland and um, I mean you will know also that there is uh, therapeutic dogs and even horses and donkeys and God knows what what they bring to the hospital for people to actually get in touch with those kind of feelings to be able to access this rela relaxation um, response so what people very very often think is that meditation is a technique so we learn it works this way 
and then if we do this, 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 we will have those results. But meditation is more actually a skill or an attitude that we um, develop over time. So it's like a little plant that we are growing in our hearts and in our minds. So we are starting to learn which things are triggering those stress responses and which things are triggering those relaxation responses. So we are after the mindsets much more than actually doing something very specific. And that's why you have different monks who come here. That's why you have different teachings. You have different ways of approaching meditation. So please, please just feel what is happening in the meditation and see what works for you to bring you into that kind of mind state that we're after. And then the meditation takes care of itself. So, again, yeah, instead of um, having this tension in the turmoil that we all know very, very well, we kind of learn how peace and stillness is encouraged. When we talk about meditation, I often use this guy here. You know this guy? Wally. Yes, it's Wally. So, um, where is Waldo, or where is Wally, or where is Walter, depending on which uh, country you are? And I often use that as a simile for meditation. So there have been all these different uh, books that have come out. It's actually uh, Mr. Martin Hanford from the UK who um, produces them and draws up those pictures. And they usually look something like this. So you have this picture and there's just, it's a lot of people and it's a lot of stuff happening. And you have to try and find Waldo and the things he is, or Wally, uh, and the things he has lost in this big mess, in this big crowd. In, in German, we call them Wimmelbilder. Bilder. It's, uh, I don't know what, what the word for Wimmel is. It's, it's just kind of like a frenzy. There's so much stuff going on. So that's what often happens in day-to-day -day life with us, and that's what often happens in our mind as well. And when we come to meditation and we sit down, that's often how it looks like. And it's so difficult to actually find um, uh, Wally in this picture. So I had a little look in the internet <laughs> and I found an alternative. There is a Zen version of Where, where is Wally? Uh, no, hang on. So first of all, um, he's there. I don't know. I think it's too small to see, but uh, you get the message how this all works. So the Zen version of Where is Waldo looks like this. <laughs> So you clear your mind, you relax, you let go, and there is just like a Zen garden and a little bird and hardly any distractions, and there is Waldo. So it's very, very easy to find Waldo. So if you try to find your body or you try to find the present moment or you try to find the breath, if there's too many things around, it doesn't really work that well. So we try to let go of as much as we can. So now, uh, again, I have that circle there again, but it's very, very easy to find Waldo. <laughs> but with meditation, we are going a step further. We are not just finding Waldo, we are turning inwards. So our senses are usually turning outwards to see what is happening in the world, what we can hear, what we can smell, what we can touch, what we can see. And in meditation, we try to let go, switch off of, of as much as possible, turn everything around and go inside, go within. And again, Internet has an answer for it. Waldo finds himself <laughs> <laughs> and starts meditating. So we look within. Uh, something useful on this path is this thing called listening. And I have a little riddle for you. I used to be a primary school teacher in the past. And uh, there is those riddles sometimes in the newspapers where you have a word. And if you mix up the letters, you can make another word out of it. So if you mix up the letters of listen, you will find a cause for listening or when it becomes easy to listen. Any? Yes, that's right. There we go. Well, you, you have to use all the letters. I don't think stillness fits, but it, it is. It is close, yes. So when we are silent, 
then we are actually listening. So you are all listening, hopefully. <laughs> and I'm the person who is doing the, the, the talking at the moment. But even though I might be talking and you might be kind of sitting there and it looks like you're listening, I don't know how much talking is going on up here <laughs> in your minds. And if there's lots of talking going up there, or you're arguing with what I'm saying, or you're thinking about what you're going to do afterwards or what happened before, then you can't really listen fully. So what we have to learn is to listen, and silence is one of the really, really important kind of circumstances that we're trying to create. And that's why we come to a place like this one here, and we meet in a room, we dim the lights, we kind of are silent and respect that silence and give it as a gift to each other, or we go to a retreat center and do the same thing, and we don't talk to each other, not because we don't like each other, but because we want to give the other person and ourselves the opportunity to very, very deeply listen. Sometimes it's also called total listening. And the way I teach meditation, I just thought I'd put it here as a refresher for the people who haven't heard it before. Another acronym. I'm not uh, very uh, patriotic here or anything. I'm not from the US, but I use the acronym USA um, to describe meditation. So the U stands for unburden. Yep. The S stands for settle. And the A stands for arrive. To put that in a little picture, so you come on this, you come to this beautiful scenery, and our lives are full of beautiful sceneries. We just have to be open enough and listen deeply enough to be able to hear them, to see them, to feel them. So what happens is we come with this huge backpack, <coughs> with all our problems and all our pains and aches in our body from our life, and we walk past this situation here, and hopefully. Once you come to meditate or you've learned to meditate, you recognize when these things come up in your life. And instead of just walking past and, and, and you know, kind of gritting your teeth, you take a bit of time and you put down your burden. So you unburden yourself from your problems, from your body, from what is happening in your mind. You settle like that person is settling on this stone here. And you start to arrive in the present moment. You start to feel what's actually happening around you. You start to see the scenery. You start to feel the sun on your skin. And then slowly, slowly, you kind of move towards the body and then turn everything around and turn uh, inside. So as Ajahn Brahm says, relax to the max. So we remember that all these things that we do out there in the world, that's fine. Sometimes they're required. But... In this space here, or when we come to our cushion and we meditate, we don't have to talk. We don't have to achieve anything. We don't have to manage things, organize things, decide or plan things. It is not required. If it happens, that's completely normal. But remember, we don't have to. We can always drop it and let it go. So instead of being busy, like this busy bee here, we just relax. We just arrive in the present moment. So another way of saying it, but I'm sure you've heard it so many times, we have the past that has happened and we can't change it. It's already gone. We have the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And there is this beautiful thing in the middle there, which we call the in-between moments. And that's what we are cultivating in meditation. That's what we are paying attention to. And we will get lost. That's completely normal. But the past will still be there, the future will still be there, but the present moment, the in-between moment, will always be there as well. So we can just gently take our attention and bring it back to that. So we will be meditating soon together. So when you do meditate, please don't ask, now what? Because that's usually what we ask at school or what you ask in life, what's the next, I've ticked this off on my book, on my list, what's the next thing? Or if you learn something at school and the, the students, I, I had the, the little kids in first grade, you know, they finish their thing and they come up to the desk, what can I do now, what can I do now? <laughs> what, what comes next? And so this cartoon here um, says it very nicely. So the person said, I let go, what do I do now? And you just keep doing what you've already been doing. If you feel that you're getting more relaxed, you're getting more still, then you're doing the right thing. So you just carry on. Right.
So I have three more words to give you to go into your meditation because sometimes it's like you're riding on a horse and you fall off that horse. And as I said, it's completely normal. It happens to everybody. It happens a bit less when you're used to meditation. So we do begin again. We just return to our meditation object. But what very, very often happens is we start to think again or we start to kind of um, uh, try to beat ourselves up and we think we're doing something wrong and this is all not supposed to happen. Uh, that's not the case. It's very, very normal. So we begin again, but we do that in a relaxed manner. And the body is usually a very, very good indicator. So if you got lost, return to your body and see what your body is doing. And if it's tensing up, relax your body. Re-relax, re-relax, re-relax. And then once you're back on that horse, really enjoy the ride. And when you do that, you will settle on that horse and you won't fall off as, as easily as, as, uh, as you did before. Great. So I just put those two pictures there again to get you in the mood for what's going to follow next. So we will be um, dimming the lights and uh, meditating together for about half an hour. It's a guided meditation, so I'll be doing a bit of talking. Okay. So if you want to take a sip of water or stretch a little bit or whatever your body needs to be doing at this time to find a relaxed posture, please do that. If you're on the sofa, on the chair, on the floor, it doesn't really matter. What matters, as we spoke about before, is the attitude that we are developing here. And whatever helps that attitude, first of all, with our bodies, let's, um, let's do that. So one of the things that we can do in our day-to-day -day life, not just in meditation, if we are in a stress response, to get our body back to the relaxation response as quickly as possible is if we work with our body and just breathe in deeply and breathe out deeply three times because that activates our parasympathetic um, nervous system and calms everything down. Just take a few deep breaths. And as you're breathing in, you can open your chest and straighten your back. And as you're breathing out, you can feel the energy coming down your spine. You can feel the gravity that settles you and relaxes you. And we're opening our chest when we breathe in. And when we breathe out, we can gently let our shoulders drop backwards and downwards. And when you do that a few times, your body will get in a comfortable position that way. So you're open, but relaxed. Receptive, but calm.
what can also help is to feel the grounding that is happening with your feet on the ground, with your butt on the chair, with your arms, your hands on your legs. So we let go of all that stuff outside as it was happening in this uh, Waldo picture and we go and just find Waldo which is our body right now. And when we meet and greet our body, let's make it feel welcomed, let's make it feel relaxed. If you do, take your attention and let it rest on your body instead of other things. See what's going on in your body. There are areas that are a bit uneasy, a bit tense. If that's the case, see if you can relax them.
if you can be aware, but kind. And if you listen deeply, your body might actually tell you what to do to make it feel more comfortable. Or it will just feel heard, it will feel seen. And as it is in a conversation, when you really listen to another person, then they relax. They feel at ease. They feel happy. If you listen and feel carefully, you will hear and feel the changes that happen. You're slowly starting to unwind. To become more still. And as your body relaxes, it tends to become heavy. Sometimes also warm or tingly. And then eventually there comes a point where it's so relaxed so at ease, it kind of falls off your radar. It fades into the background.
and you arrive more fully in the present moment. We are reasonably relaxed and the mind is not spinning around the body that much. Very often we meet this thing that I talked about, we meet imagination. And imagination is unfortunately often used to run on, on those fear programs, on those planning programs. They're not useful at this time. Let's see if we can run another program instead. Imagine a beautiful place that makes you relaxed and at ease. It might be in nature, it might be at home. It might not be a place that much, but it might be people you really, really like to hang out with. It might be pets. It might be the Buddha. It might be angels or higher beings whatever scenario gives you this feeling of safety security a refuge let's cultivate that you happen to get lost in your body or in thoughts that pull you away 
no problem. Just begin again. Let go again. Re-relax. this energy, this stillness and relaxation of the relaxation response shows up. Welcome it. Hang out with it. Nurture and encourage it. Or if you do need a little visual trigger, you can open your eyes and look at that little kitten and the dog and get inspired that way. And then dip back into meditation. Once you get the hang of it and you are able to relax your thinking as well, like you relaxed your body before, it starts to vanish, to fade away. And you are left with a beautiful feeling and very often it's accompanied by the breath which is just very smoothly and gently going in and out. And if you have a beautiful mind, if you really listen to your breathing deeply with your heart, it's like a song, it's like a story that draws you in even further, into more peace, into more stillness, into more energy, but a very, very quiet but powerful energy. And just like if someone tells you a really, really interesting story and you get really pulled into this story, if it's the story of stillness and peace, let yourself be carried away. But instead of being carried outside, you're carried deep, deep inside.
let you meditate on your own for a little while before we finish the meditation. If your body shows up, be kind to it and relax it and let it go. If you're thinking into fears, think wholesome thoughts, think inspiring thoughts, think thoughts that calm you down. And if you're hanging out with your breath or with these beautiful feelings that start to emerge, just enjoy their company. you happen to get lost, you have already found yourself once you realize. See where Waldo is in your picture and come back to that. Hopefully now, because we had a peaceful and calm environment around us, people encouraging us, who are meditating with us, a little bit of guidance. Hopefully our sensitivity, our listening skill has improved. And let's turn it now to this body and this mind of ours and see how it feels, see how it has changed.
get your heart around this relaxation response and how it feels like. and how it can be created and cultivated. And before we come back to this room and the outside world, another opportunity to listen, but this time to the bell. Try to listen to it as attentively as you can, just listening without thinking what's going to come afterwards or what happened before. Just follow the sound of the bell. One of the, yeah, you can now open your eyes and wiggle your body and stretch. That's one of the, the question here, I had a peek at the question, <laughs> was um, how do you spread the Dhamma to children effectively? So the singing bowl is one of the tools that we often use because it's something which draws your attention in and then it becomes more and more and more and more and more and qui more quiet and it leads you towards stillness. So this singing bowl is basically doing what we're doing in meditation. It carries your attention, it carries your mind from a more active state to a more peaceful and calm state. Okay, and you're back to this one, okay. This one goes. Oh, great. Yes. So I have another set of slides here. So I promised I will talk a little bit about um, the concept uh, in Buddhism of metta, which uh, I often coin as love, as the real love. And the other term that we uh, use as well, which is called karuna, which is kind of the more outgoing um, type of love when we see someone who is suffering, when we see there is something outside in the world that is not going that well or someone is, is in a situation of distress. So we share that love with that other person. So it's a, an unconditional uh, kindness or friendliness. So the Valentine's Day love is maybe a bit more like this. It's this kind of, and they lived happily ever after type of love. It's the kind of love that we fall into. And that doesn't really last though. For people who have lived in a relationship or who live in a monastery with other people, uh, or in the office where, or wherever it is, the other kind of type of love, the care for other beings, is something which needs to be maintained. It's something which is more like an attitude. The falling in love is kind of like a feeling, but a feeling is like a blip. It's something which flares up and then disappears again. But 
the real love is something which is much more sustained and an attitude is something which is kind of in the background and it influences how we think, how we see the world and how we act in the world more than just this kind of temporary attraction to a certain object. So once we hear about this love thing uh, for the first time maybe or once we become teenies and all that and, and we see movies and all these kind of things then it's like this box I have here. So the love is inside the box but we don't really know what it is. We kind of often get carried away by, by the box or the announcements. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite quiet this time. They switched it off in here, I guess, hey? Because it's not... Oh, okay. Right. Anyway, so we have this box with love inside. And if we're talking about the Valentine's love, or wait, I, I mean, I, I'm just coining it that way now. <laughs> then we are often talking about the rose-colored glasses <laughs> love. <laughs> When I was visiting my family uh, in Switzerland, or actually my brother in Germany recently, they ha had those glasses. So I put them on and uh, <laughs> they found it so funny, so we did take a picture. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the love which doesn't really see the world as it is. It kind of adds so much to the world, or it just wants to see what it wants to see, but it doesn't see the whole picture. So it kind of gets carried away by the wrapping of this box. And the other side of love, I would call more like friendship. Because again, friendship is something which is much more sustained, which is much more stable. So when we talk about love, I often like to talk about the progression of love. Because it usually starts with an attraction or with falling in love. And as someone else has said, if that stage wouldn't be there, maybe we wouldn't even get involved with other people. So it, it has, its, it has its, um, its place. But it starts with romantic love, and then it usually shifts at a certain point to what I coined realistic love. So we kind of start to know the person we live with um, a little bit differently. So it's not this kind of candlelight dinner thing where we don't really see everything that's going on and we might be imagining a lot of things around what is actually there. But um, we don't stop there because if it would be just this kind of realistic love, uh, it doesn't really work. <laughs> so we have to switch to what I like to coin real love and that's the concept of metta in Buddhism. So how does that look like? So once the box opens, then what we find inside is a heart. But it's not a beautiful heart. It's a battered heart. It's a broken heart very often. And uh, this quote that uh, I found that another teacher was using is, love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. Because if we are really honest, if we're really looking very deep inside of us, there is things we don't really like that much, and our heart is not perfect, but we can approach it with kindness and understanding. And once we start to see what's happening within us and within our own hearts, we learn to approach the people around us in a similar manner. So I have presented some of this before, I uh, used a few catchphrases to try and describe what this meta means. So it means respect, which would be a sentence, I respect your strengths, your choices, your limitations. Acceptance, I take you as you are. That's what real love says, not I only take you if you do what I want and if you look the way I want you to look like, or whatever it is. It is the friendship I talked about before. So we are in this together. Ajahn Brahm often says when he marries people, once they're married, it's not about you or me anymore. It's about us, because we're entering in a relationship here. So if something happens in your life, it's not his problem anymore, or it's not my problem anymore. It's our problem. We solve it together. 
And uh, we count on each other. We support each other. That's what friendship is. Unconditional kindness, the kind of phrase from Ajahn Brahm, the, to- the door of my heart is open to you. Completely open, unconditionally, and I put in brackets there, even if. Dot, dot, dot. You can fill the dots there. We're giving freedom to the other person. We're giving freedom to ourselves. We encourage the other person. We want them to grow. We ourselves want to grow in the relationship. So we kind of say to them, do your thing. I trust you. I trust what you're doing and I will support you in whatever you want. Whatever you kind of um, see as your purpose in your life or whatever you're dealing with at this point in time. And then also forgiveness is part of true love, of deep love, of starting over again, trusting again, uh, even though things have might, have might have happened that hurt us in a relationship. And it's, it's kind of unavoidable that that will happen. And that will give us the strength and the resilience to actually have a relationship that, that lasts. So there's a few kind of words that describe love here in those love letters. Uh, or in those yeah, letters that make the word love. So we cherish people, we hold t- people, we enjoy them, we care for them, we are, embrace them, to give you some more ideas where this kind of is leading. And Aya Kema is one of the teachers. I never met her personally, but I lived in her monastery for two, two years. And um, as she has a monastery, or she founded a monastery, which is called Metta Vihara. And she always said she wants to establish the school of the heart because we have the school of, um, you know, learning how to cope in business and all these kind of things. But the, the, the school of the heart or the heart is often kind of left out. And she said, we shouldn't try to get love. Instead, we should be giving love because if we're trying to get love, we sometimes will. But even if we do, it's very kind of unpredictable and we kind of make ourselves quite dependent as well and we start to manipulate and do all these other kind of things but if we develop love in our own hearts we have it we have love <laughs> so we don't need it anymore <laughs> and we will give it freely and people will get inspired to do the same thing and then we have a good relationship where people love each other and love themselves <laughs> and the problem is solved <laughs> I know it it sounds easy, (laughs) but uh, we have to hear these things a few times. So the quote from her is, On the spiritual path, there is nothing to get and everything to get rid of. Obviously, the first thing to let go of is trying to get love and instead to give it. That's the secret of the spiritual path. One has to give oneself wholeheartedly. Whatever we do half-heartedly brings half-hearted results. How can we give ourselves? By not holding back, by not wanting for ourselves. If we want to be loved, we are looking for a support system. If we want to love, we are looking for spiritual growth. It's that simple. (laughs) And uh, I've brought a poem that I would like to read to you. It's called Love Means Letting Go. And it goes as follows. Letting go of the expectations to gain something. Letting go of the idea of losing something when we give. Letting go of the compulsion to play a role to please others. Letting go of the views how others should be. Letting go of the desire to take possession of things and people. Letting go of the state of being dependent. Letting go in order to be free to really love others. And that little poem was written by this guy on your right, which is me when I was 21, (laughs) when I ordained for the first time in uh, India under uh, Most Venerable Acharya Buddha Rakita, who was my first teacher. Because I was kind of reflecting on the... on this thing, love, for quite a long time. And I uh, also at the teacher training college, uh, we had like a thesis to write. And my thesis wa- was, what is love? 
And I think I was actually really looking for this term of meta, even back then. So it's been a long journey. <laughs> Another quote from Ayakema, which concerns this business of this pure and true love, which he calls the best insurance policy. When we are able to arouse love in our hearts without any cause, just because love is the heart's quality, we feel secure. It is impossible to buy security, even though many people would like to do so. Insurance companies have the largest buildings because people try to buy security. But when we create certainty within, though uh, through a loving heart, we feel assured that our reactions and feelings are not going to be, be detrimental to our own or other people's happiness. And that's kind of alluding to what I was talking about before. So we take the jack out of the box and we put love in there. So no matter what comes and triggers us, if we have this ability to meet it with understanding, to meet it with deep love, then it doesn't become a problem anymore. Then it doesn't trigger us in the same way anymore. We have to protect ourselves sometimes if we are in an abusive relationship, for example. We have to get distance, but we don't have to stop loving. We can still love the person. We can still respect the person. We can still forgive the person, even though it's very, very difficult. But it can be done. There is this beautiful story that Arjun Brahm tells where someone came up to him at the monastery to um, talk to him and said, uh, I've been coming to this place for, I don't know what it was, 10 years or something, and I've been listening to your teachings. And I've been in an abusive relationship, and I really took to heart what you said. And I went back home, and every time my partner, instead of beating me or swearing at me, did a good thing, I did really encourage him. I did really um, help him to grow that part of him. And he has turned around, and he has become such a beautiful person. And uh, I'm so grateful to you guys that you're teaching this kind of stuff. But it does take time. But if it goes into your heart and you start living that way, you will change and the people around you will change in a very deep, um, meaningful way. So, if you would have a friend who is in need and they need something little, which takes maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day, a week, to help them out, what would you do? Would you try to soothe someone's physical or mental pain when you see they are in distress? Most likely. But what if that person is you? Respect and kindness towards others is something that is highly praised in our world. And it's rightly so, and I don't want to discourage anyone to do that. But don't miss out on the other part, where we do the same thing. We respect and we have kindness towards ourselves. And that's one of the other pictures I found online, but it's one which I find so beautiful. It's this kind of person in this messy bathroom. <laughs> that's kind of what life is. But she is hugging herself in her mirror. And if we can do that mentally, <coughs> it's, it's a very beautiful thing. And it will change, change our lives and our minds. So why is it so hard to do things for ourselves, which we would happily do for others? Like taking a bit of time every day to relax and grow without having guilt. Like taking 15 to 30 minutes because you're stressed to get your stress rep response and replace it with your relaxation response. We deserve it too. And when we do that, we will become a better person and we will become a better person to be around in our life outside there. So it's not selfish. <laughs> so through caring, we learn to accept our, uh, and understand our own feelings and emotions. And through doing that, we can then relate to other people. He can, we can really help them because we understand how these things work. And... Uh, Yes, it will take us a long way. So, another acronym. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not throwing too much information at you, but um, uh, the word care also kind of encapsulates quite nicely what this love-caring business means. 
the first step is of often one of the most difficult steps because as in meditation when you're sitting there and your body is uncomfortable you don't really want to turn to your body if your mind is going all over the place or you're thinking thoughts that you don't really want to have it's uncomfortable so the first step of caring, caring is actually to be courageous so if it, there is someone out there on the street in your neighborhood in your family and they're suffering sometimes we want to walk away sometimes we have a fear response we have a response of wanting to run away so we have to be courageous we have to put ourselves out there we have to listen we have to open ourselves up to feel their pain and if we are used to do that with our own pain it becomes easier to do that with other people's pain as well and then the next step is acceptance that heart of ours that I had in the picture there it's not perfect our partner is not perfect our life is not perfect that's just how life is that's the human condition but if we learn to accept it and then work with it in a wholesome way instead of trying to push it away or resisting or getting angry then we can take steps towards solving the problem the next step is reassuring reassuring ourselves reassuring another person and to me the picture that comes up is often the child that has hurt itself or has a problem and we just go up to that being and listen to that being take it in our arms share some time with it and reassure um, that other being or reassure ourselves and the E is a very important part that often gets left out and where we often get kind of entangled into situations so sometimes no one well sometimes we have to pull back as I said because the relationship doesn't really work and we have to kind of tell another person your um, behavior has certain consequences and the consequences in this a moment mean that I have to pull back or I have to not be in contact with you or I have to walk away at that certain point in town time but we should also try and to empower that other person to solve the problem by themselves to take the steps that they have to take so even in Buddhism when we're talking about the teaching the Buddha is only able to show us the path to give us the teaching to give us the map and that's what we are kind of doing when we're caring we're connecting with another person we are giving them the feeling and the response of saying I see you I feel you I understand you but we can't fix their feelings inside so we can empower them we can be a good example or we can give them some tools but they will have to do the work they will have to walk and it's the same thing if we are in a difficult situation it's wonderful if we have friends if it's wonderful if we have tools if we have techniques if we reach out but the actual work is happening inside here so we have to empower ourselves and we have to learn to empower other beings as well and that's kind of maybe what leads into the question of how do we teach younger beings in this world how do we teach children how do we teach the youth so of course our duty as parents or as teachers in the beginning is to protect those beings because they're vulnerable they're small they have to learn a lot of things so we do that but there comes a point where we have to trust them where we have to allow them to make their own experiences we have to allow them to make mistakes we have to allow them to think for themselves we have to allow them to to see how it is to be a grown-up and then we have to start to empower them but we can start doing that with little little with little children or even with children you know I had first graders in my classroom and I always made it a point that I was just the instructor I was the person who would uh, build hopefully in, in a conducive environment where they felt safe in where all the material was there to learn but I can't learn for a child the child has to learn themselves so I give them the tools I put them in a good environment and I act as a good example that teaches them much much more than when we tell them what to do because if we tell them what to do and we do something different they're not going to do it <laughs> because they're like you're not doing it why should I do it <laughs> But if we just quietly do the right thing, they will follow suit on some stage.
So I had someone who came up to me in Melbourne and asked about youth and said, you know, my teenies, they don't listen to me. What can I do? I thought about it and said, do you listen to them? If you sit down and listen to them, they feel seen, they feel heard. They have lots of great ideas. They have lots of energy and you can encourage them and you can guide them. But once you start to tell them, listen to me and I know what to do and I have the experience, it's not going to go down that well. <laughs> so if we set a good example there and start to listen to the people in our own lives and start to listen to them, then they will actually start coming to us with the problems they might have. And then we can guide them because they have asked us. And... Um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, <laughs> now I lost my, my thread there. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, yeah, we, we, we just act as a good example. And we trust them. And we support them even if they make mistakes. And if we have a good relationship with them, then when they make the mistakes, they will come and tell us about them. If the relationship has been a good one. And then if we accept it with understandness and kindness and try to find a solution and try to support them in their emotional life which is tends to be quite difficult around that time and age then they will come back in the future and then they will actually grow um, if we react badly and if we kind of you know tell them off it's usually the last time they have told us about something that went wrong in their life and they've kind of lost a friend. They lost someone who has a lot of life experience that they would be happy to share with them, but um, they're going to go and trust their peers instead. And their peers, unfortunately, they don't have the experience that some people have that have gone through a few things. And um, yeah, that can be a bit dangerous. So if we can catch it early, it's wonderful. So it's if... Uh, it's like with smoking, for example. Smoking is a habit that develops over time. And if our children were to try smoking and then come up to a person they trust to talk about their first experience of smoking, it's usually a very unpleasant experience. They cough a lot, it stinks, blah, 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 blah. But what happens is they kind of start to get used to it and they start to do whatever their friends do, and then it gets to in a kind of a habit loop, which is quite, quite, quite difficult to break. So if we can catch it early, and if we can encourage them to kind of really take those thoughts in that are there when they're making, when they've been, they're having that experience, to steer away from it, uh, then uh, we can kind of help with with that. Uh, I don't know. I hope I kind of answered that question more or less uh, where is she okay yes or is that okay or any anything that leads leads up to that question all good all right is there any questions left to ask or do we want to close you can always come up to ask questions afterwards I usually stay back if you want to ask something in private <laughs> right.